I'm going to need you all to be loose this morning. You can, you can, you can, you can sit down. Um, I'm going to need you all to be loose because this, because this text is intense. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be awkward at times, um, but we're just going to have to, we're just going to plow through it. We're going to plow through it together. All right. Slim, slim joke last week. Uh, he was making jokes about alien popping out of chests and stuff like that. And he said that, uh, and he said that this week would be, would be more family friendly. It's, it's not. Um, so, so I apologize, uh, but, but we're going to, but we're going to do it anyway. So, uh, so let's, so, so we're in the book of Genesis. And so over the last few months, as we've gone through the book, the earth has gone through a lot. In, in Genesis 1, it was formed out of nothing by the triune God. And then this God creates human beings, gives them free will, and the opportunity to live in paradise or be kicked out and die. And they choose the latter. And they corrupt the entire creation along with themselves. And, and one generation later, you've got siblings killing each other. And you, and you give folks a, a few more years and murder and death have spread through the whole world. If, if a TV breaks in your house, who's responsible for fixing it? The one, the one, the one in the household who's, who's responsible for fixing electronics. I want, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, if your, t, if your TV freezes, what, what's the first thing you try to do? Turn it off and on again. Or unplug it and plug it back in, right? So if, you're, if, your, phone, if your phone freezes, like, that, like what, there, there, there are three options. You have a soft reset, a hard reset, and a factory reset. Soft reset is just, is just re, it, restarts the, it, it, it restarts the phone. This is the, this is the unplug, plug it back in option. But sometimes you need something a little, some, sometimes you need a little more. The issue's a little bigger. So you go for the hard reset. So what's that, what that's going to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe your app's memories, but it's not going to wipe all your data. That's a hard reset. But sometimes the issue is even deeper. Sometimes the problem is systemic. Sometimes maybe there's a virus in your computer that's corrupted your data. At that point, you've got to go nuclear. You've got to do the factory reset. Data's erased, your phone is restored to factory conditions. If you think back to Genesis 1, the Earth's factory conditions were a vast and empty mass of chaotic waters. And so God, in the flood, is saying, we're going back to factory conditions. I'm shutting it all down. That's what the flood, that's what the flood is. This isn't an unplug, plug it back in situation. This, is, this, this sin has corrupted the world to the point that God utters over it the declaration that this is unsalvageable. Except for Noah. Being a God of grace, God sets his favor on Noah and his family and saves them through the ark. He makes a covenant with Noah and the earth, and he tells Noah and his family to do what Adam and Eve were supposed to do, to be fruitful and multiply, start over. And in the background of this text, what's being said is, hey, this time, do it right. Well, let's find out what happens. Please stand for the reading of God's word. We're in Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 29. of Noah went, who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. 
All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. This is the word of the Lord. God, please be seated. You can pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name or to hear your word uh, or to be shaped by your spirit. Lord, open your scriptures to us this morning. Reveal to us who you are, who you've called us to be, and the resources that you've given us to shape us. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we pray these things in the name of your Son and by the power of your Spirit. Amen. So to set the tone, I have a quote from, from, from Yale historian David Brian Davis. It should be up there. And so David Brian Davis is one of the nation's foremost historians of slavery. And his brilliant book, In Human Bondage, is a must-read if you, if you ever want to learn about, about slavery in the New World. But here's what he said about the passage that we're dealing with today. No other passage in the Bible has had such a disastrous influence through human history as Genesis 9, 18 to 27. No other passage in the Bible has had such a disastrous influence through human history as Genesis 9, 18 to 27. So we're dealing with fire this morning. We're dealing with a text that has been wielded to wound. We're dealing with a text that has been weaponized to justify brutal oppression and generations of death and violence. We're dealing with the central biblical text in the history of anti-black racism. Now, racism is not a black-white binary, brothers and sisters, but Christians are particularly at fault for anti-black racism in a way that must be reckoned with and in a way that makes it easier for other forms of racism to creep in. So let's, so let's handle it. So we have a few questions that we've got to deal with. What's actually going on in the text? What does it mean? How has it been used? How should it be used? Join me on this journey, as we might not end up where you may expect. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Racism? I don't see that in the text. Yeah, neither do I. So. Let's start, let's start by finding out what's actually in the text. So, so it begins in a relatively straightforward way. Verse 18 and 19. Here are Noah's sons, from which everyone on earth is descended. Also, by the way, Ham is Canaan's father. And that's a weird detail. We're going to have to come back to that, because obviously it gets weirder. So verse, verses 20 and 21. Good old Noah begins to work a vineyard. He grows a few grapes, cultivates some wine. One evening he turns up a little too much, ends up naked. Happens to the best of us, no shade. Hopefully it does. Anyway, then, then Ham, who we're told again is the father of Canaan, sees the nakedness of his father. And he goes out and he tells his brothers, who out of care for their naked father, cover him up walking backwards so that they do not see him naked. Now that phrase, sees the nakedness of his father, is important. We're going to come back to that. Noah wakes up and curses not Ham, but Ham's son, Canaan. And this is no small curse. Canaan is going to be a slave of slaves. He'll be the lowest of the low. Another very important point, and a somewhat weird detail. He then blesses Shem and Japheth. Noah lives a little longer, and then he dies. End of story, right? No, this is is way too weird. Now, I'm not going to spend all of our time on this, but it's important for us to understand the events of the text. There are two big glaring questions that this text literally screams out to any person who reads it, especially for the first time. First, what in the world is so bad about Ham seeing his father's nakedness, that it leads to his son being pretty strictly cursed. And second, why is Canaan cursed and not Ham? There are three common interpretations of what it meant for Ham to see his father's nakedness. Parents, I apologize for what's about to come. First, Ham, the, the, the first interpretation is that Ham just sees his dad naked and he makes fun of him to his brothers. 
Now that's probably the interpretation that most of you have heard most often and are probably most comfortable with. The second is a rabbinical interpretation. That is, it, it comes from, from Jewish rabbis, and it's that Ham castrates his father, who's in a vulnerable position, and it's a, it's a, it's a power move. The third is that Ham sexually abuses his father in some way. So to summarize the debate, the first one, there's, people, people think that there's, an, that there's an issue with Ham just seeing his father naked because it seems there, there, there are suggestions in the text that something deeper is going on there. Something, something, something is, it seems like something has to merit that kind of curse. In the second interpretation, although something more seems to be going on, I mean, there's nothing to suggest that it's castration. And the third one, I mean, the third one's just gross. And it's not explicit in the text, some might say. But I'm going to throw a wrench in it. I don't think any of those three interpretations actually do justice to the literary brilliance of the biblical text. There's another interpretation that makes actually more sense of the text than those three. And that's the one that I take. And it's, in a sense, worse than those three. Now, before you yell at me, before you stand up and leave, before you think, goodness gracious, I trusted Malcolm, my kids are here, this is crazy. Consider how euphemisms work. I was talking to Michael Richards on Friday. Hey, Mike. A few days, about, a few days ago about health care. And in this conversation, he brought up that in that sector, sometimes you have departments that go by the name of patient safety and quality assurance. They may also go by the name of risk management. Is it really about patient safety? Is it really about quality assurance? Or is it really the how to not get sued department? When, when you explain the death of a loved one to a child, you often find ways to do it without mentioning death. A person has passed away. That person is no longer with us. That person went to a better place. All of these phrases often attempt to dull the pain of death. They attempt to, to shave off the sharp edges of death. In the scriptures, sex is often referred to euphemistically. Adam and Cain, before this in Genesis, they know their wives. There are plenty of other examples like that, and one of them is to see someone's nakedness or to uncover someone's nakedness. So what is this interpretation? In Leviticus 18, in a long list of sexual sins that Israel is supposed to avoid, especially because they're supposedly, especially because they're common among the Canaanites and the Egyptians, two significant enemies of Israel, the very first general offense is, I think it should be up on the, up on the screen, don't approach any one of your close relatives to uncover nakedness. Okay? Now, already you know that that's not, it's not literal, just kind of seeing someone naked. I mean, how, how, are, how are you going to change diapers? Now, the first specific example is in verse 7. It reads as follows. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. That, I believe, is the sin of Ham. That he uncovers his father's nakedness by having a child with his mother. In a move that a number of Old Testament sons attempt in order to shame their fathers and insult their patriarchal authority. It's something, that, it's something that Absalom does to David's concubines in, in public. It, should, it, should, it, it, it shows up in a, few, in a few other places. And so then the pieces begin to fall together. Why, why is Ham constantly referred to as the father of Canaan? This is telling how he becomes the father of Canaan. Why is the curse so intense? Why does Noah wake up and know what his youngest son had done to him? Yeah. One more point of connection. The book of Genesis is all about beginnings. 
The original hearers and readers of this text, whether we're looking at, uh, or, or, or whether we're looking at the people in, in the Exodus or, or whether we're looking at the, the exilic community, the community coming, coming out of exile from the land, when they, when they hear Canaan's name, they know, wait a minute, this is one of our enemies. There's another text later in Genesis. After Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, um, Lot and his daughters, Lot's daughters get him drunk and get pregnant by him. The fruit of that is Moab and Ammon, two of Israel's greatest enemies. These incestuous relationships lead to Israel's greatest enemies. As that happened with Lot and his daughters, so also with Ham and his mother. So what's then going on in this text? Noah gets drunk, gets naked, presumably to be with his wife. Ham goes in, takes advantage, goes out and brags to his brothers. His brothers go in, clothe their father, and are extra careful to not even give the appearance of disrespect. Noah finds out, curses Canaan, and utters blessing on Shem and Japheth. Now, obviously, there are, there are going to be questions with any of these interpretations, but maternal incest actually answers most of them. Now, that's hard enough. It's a weird text with horrific implications. You would think, well, it can't get any worse, right? Well, I can assure you, David Bryan Davis's quote did not come from his interpretation of Ham's sin. What, what, what Davis was responding to was well over a thousand years of biblical interpretation. Biblical interpretation to what end, you might ask? To justify the enslavement of black Africans. Muslim, European Christian, and Jewish interpreters stood hand in hand interpreting this text to mean that God cursed black Africans to perpetual slavery. Raise your hand if you have ever heard of the curse of Ham. First of all, I mean, you know, first issue is that if you read the text, Ham's not the one who's cursed. There's the first issue. But also, when you think about this text, we, I, like I said, I, I'm sure you have the same question that I had. How in the world do you get there? I want to be clear about this. Nothing in the text or even in any post-biblical Jewish writing is blackness of skin linked to slavery. In fact, nothing in this text has anything to do with skin color. But here's what happened. People took the long tradition of understanding the mark of Cain to be the mark of blackness, already ridiculous heresy, already contrary to the text because the mark that God gives him is a mark of protection, not a curse, but that's heresy. Link it, link it, link it with another heresy of this, of this, curse, this curse of Ham that apparently this means because, first of all, you've got to import into the text that Ham somehow is black, and then, and then, and then his descendants, and then you, you're adding this interpretation that, that all of his descendants are to be slaves forever. And that is then, this toxic soup is then used to justify the enslavement and constant affirmation of the inferiority of black Africans. The Spanish and the Portuguese, and later the British, Dutch, and French, would use these biblical narratives, twist these interpretations to justify their greed and their pride, and those interpretations become mainstream in white and black communities. Alexander Crummel, one of the most prominent black intellectuals of the 19th century, Episcopal rector and an abolitionist, would say in 1862, the opinion that the sufferings and the slavery of the Negro race are the consequences of the curse of Noah is a general, almost universal opinion in the Christian world. It is found in books written by learned men, and it is repeated in lectures, speeches, sermons, and common conversation. So strong and tenacious is the hold which it has taken upon the mind of Christendom that it seems almost impossible to uproot it. Indeed, it is an almost foregone conclusion that the Negro race is an accursed race, weighed down even to the present beneath the burden of an ancestral 
malediction. As black communities would go through slavery, lynching, Jim Crow, in church you would hear, we're fighting against a curse. We're fighting against the curse of Ham. This would, go, this would come from white and, and black pulpits. This, this interpretation is why Mormons did not allow black people in the priesthood until 1978. This false interpretation of scripture has ruined countless lives and has been used to justify profound evils. It even reverberates in our society today. After all, legal segregation is not actually that far from us. And the economic and social effects of Jim Crow still shape our communities. So why should we care now? Because this is a case study in how to wield the word. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures are not a tool for us to use how we see fit. The history of the so-called curse of Ham reminds us that the temptation to rip the scriptures out of their context to fit our desires, that temptation constantly crouches at our door. This is what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. It is to use the great resources that the Lord has given us for emptiness, for oppression, for self. But if that's the wrong way to wield the word, what's the right way? If we've seen what this text says and, and, and what people have distorted the text to say in their own self-interest, what, what use does this text actually have for the people of God? Well, let's, let's zoom back out. Remember when we went through the story of Genesis? We were, we were created in perfection, but once Adam and Eve sinned, that corruption began to spread. In fact, one of their sons kills his brother. In the words of Ron Burgundy, whoo, boy, that, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. The world goes to hell in a handbasket, and then, and then you have the flood, the factory reset. And Noah gets, an, Noah gets another chance, and then his son does what he does. Sin is nothing to be played with, brothers and sisters. Sometimes it works slowly. Sometimes it pounces quickly. But in all cases, it seeks to destroy us and our families. One of the things that this text reminds us of is the fact that our sin is not just about us. It's so easy for us to think about our words, our thoughts, and our actions and say, well, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's fine. But do you know how these things affect those around you? R regardless of how you may feel about your parents, you've taken things from them. It may be the way that you look. It may be the way that you sound. It may be particular tendencies. Some of that is nature. But we don't just genetically take after our families. There are things that are both caught and taught in these relationships. I'm incredibly thankful for my relationship with, 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 my, with my father. And, and, and if you were to find a video of him, of him speaking on, on YouTube, you'd, you'd see that we sound alike, and I take like roughly 98% of my mannerisms from him. Uh, if, you were to, if you were to meet my mom, you, you, you'd find that I take other personality traits from her. But, but it also, if you, dug, if you dig deeper into my life, you'll also find that I didn't, just take, I didn't just take good things from them. I may have taken vices from them as well. And I'm sure that they, as, as, as any parent does, they never want their children to see, much less exhibit, their flaws. But often that's the way that it works. Whether you know it or not, someone around you is following your lead. The scriptures continually remind us that sin is not just individual and personal. It's also communal. And so when you sin, it hurts all of us. I'm saying this to the Mosaic family. We, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a community that's covenanted together, when, when you suffer, we suffer. When you sin, that affects all of us. Maybe not in ways that we can see, but in real ways nonetheless. The man or woman addicted to or who dabbles in pornography may think that it's innocent, but it shapes and deforms your views of your brothers and sisters, and it poisons relationships. 
The angry husband who's not gentle with his wife poisons his marriage, poisons his friendships, and poisons his children. A number of years ago, I read a book called The Oath by Frank Peretti. Frank Peretti is like the king of what's called spiritual warfare fiction. A few, few years ago, I was really into this stuff. I was also really into Left Behind. Great, great series, horrible theology, horrible theology, but great series. Anyway, Frank Peretti, in this book, in this book, The Oath, there's a town where, where, where members of the town develop a black rash that starts off small and incredibly painful, but it eventually spreads and the sufferer begins to lose the ability to feel the pain. But it also stinks to everyone around these people, but the individual never notices. That's an allegory for sin. It hurts at first, but then get used to it. It continues to spread and corrupt, but, but you don't feel it. But the people around you do. Ham's sin didn't just affect him. The curse extended to his son, Canaan. Canaan was cursed to be a slave of slaves to his brothers, and we see in the next chapter that numerous enemies of Israel would come from Canaan. And we also learn from Leviticus that they repeat the sins of their fathers and are held accountable accordingly. Sin has consequences beyond your immediate circumstances, brothers and sisters. It's not to be played with. The curse of your sins affects those who come after you. It, it, sobers, me, it, it sobers me to think about the fact that, that even as a baby, Jasmine is watching her dad. She's watching how I treat Desiree. She's, she's, she's watching how I spend my time. She's watching how I interact with those around her. This, this morning, uh, as, I, as, 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 we were, as we were getting ready for church, Desiree, Desiree would jokingly kind of, kind of block, block Jasmine's line of vision, and she, Jasmine would push, would push Desiree away to look at me. People are watching, imbibing, learning, We've, we've, and, 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 we're, and we're struggling with all of these things, brothers and sisters, things that seem harder to shake because they're in our families. Maybe it's alcoholism, something that is both genetic, but it's also caught from learned behavior. Maybe, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's pride. You may have in your mind one of these sins that's, that's hard to repent from because you're so used to it, and maybe your family is too. Maybe you're starting to lose hope. Maybe, you're, maybe you just think, well, this is just something I'm never going to be. I, I, I don't have any resources to fight this. I, there's, there's no way that I'm ever going to be free of this sin. Do not lose hope, dear brother. Do not lose hope, dear sister. Because there is no sin greater than your Savior, no matter how deep it runs. It's important that when we talk about the passing down of sin and the passing down of curses, as we think, I mean, this is, this is, this is our doctrine of original sin, that, 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 that this is something that we've inherited from our first human father. But we're not, we're, we're not talking about, in this case, we're not talking about final judgment. So here's, here's what I want to be clear about. The sins of your parents do not determine your salvation. They affect you, yes, and most likely will continue to, but... They cannot damn you. It is your own sin that does that, of which we have plenty. But sin does not have the final word, nor did it in Genesis 9. After Noah cursed Canaan, he blessed whom? Well, let's take a look at verses 26 and 27. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Note that Japheth is, is blessed, but Shem isn't really explicitly blessed. Instead, Noah blesses the Lord, the God of Shem. Why might this be the case? Well, if, if curses can be passed down, why not blessings? In fact, 
because curses are passed down, of course blessings are passed down as well. And so though you, may pay, though you may pass down the effects of your sin to those who come after you, if you're a member of the covenant community, you're also passing down, you're also passing down blessings of being a member of that community. The Christian mother or, and or father who have a child, they don't guarantee the salvation of that child. But one of the reasons that we as Presbyterians baptize infants is because we affirm that there are real, tangible, gracious benefits to being being a member of the covenant community. In Genesis 9, in the blessing of Japheth and Shem, what you're witnessing is a narrowing of a covenantal promise. And so remember back in Genesis 3, back when the serpent was cursed, and he was told by God, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That was the first glimmer of the gospel, that somewhere down the line of humanity, a savior was coming. But in the next generation, all we seemed to see was death and murder, at least in the case of Abel and Cain. But then another son came, Seth. And so we traced Seth's line until we got to Noah. And then we get the reset, and the options are restricted again. Where is this Messiah going to come from? Well, the book of Genesis is all about that because it comes out of Shem's line. Shem gets traced to, to, to Terah. Terah is the father of Abram, whose name would be changed by God to Abraham. Abraham to Isaac. Isaac to Jacob. Jacob to Judah. Generation after generation until we make it to a young girl who, being betrothed to be married, finds herself mysteriously pregnant. A young girl whose husband-to-be received a dream where an angel said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we need a Savior who can cleanse our bloodlines. We need a Savior who can cleanse our hearts, our thoughts, our minds, our bodies, and our souls. And the one that the Lord saw fit to give us, our Lord Jesus Christ, came from a line that was not perfect. We talked about incest being the source of Israel's greatest enemies. We often forget that incest, Judah, was, was, was Tamar's father-in-law. Even, even sexual assault in, in David and Bathsheba. All of these things played a part in Jesus' own bloodline. So does who you come from determine who you are? No. But it does shape you. And this is why it's important that when we consider our Savior... We consider the one who was and is now not only human, taking his flesh from his mother, but who was first eternal God, having always existed as God and carrying out the mission of his heavenly father. He is the one whom corruption cannot stand, whether it's in his bloodline or before his face. He is the one who touched the leper and did not contract leprosy because his holiness was more contagious than any virulent disease. He is the one who, though born according to the flesh in poverty, poured out his riches for all mankind. Jesus Christ is the one who died to take away your sin, to redeem you from your corruption, to heal your wounds that ooze and stink and infect those around you, to set, to set you right with God and with your neighbor. God made a covenant with Adam, and Adam failed. He and his offspring, Cain failed, Noah failed, Ham failed, every single human being has failed until the triune God sent one of their number to be both covenant maker and covenant keeper. The good news is truly good news, brothers and sisters, and it is good news for all. The curse on Canaan was not a perpetual one. It was not a curse that would apply to all of his offspring forever. It was not even a curse that led to final judgment. Because remember, there are Canaanites in the covenant community of Israel. Rahab, Canaanite prostitute, in the line of Jesus. Ruth, a Moabite, in the line of Jesus. Nothing places someone out of the reach of the Savior. No curse, no nothing. So how should you and I wield the word? We wield it for this purpose, to show the world the grace of our God. Many have and continue to use the scriptures for their own gain. 
to maintain their own power, to make money, or some other reason. We must not do so, brothers and sisters. There are those who seek to use the scriptures to avoid compassion. When our brothers and sisters suffer, we just say, well, God works all things for the good of those who love him, and then we walk away, when what's needed is for us to sit with our brothers and sisters. We must not do so, brothers and sisters. There are those who use the scriptures to oppress, to build false structures of superiority and inferiority, and we must not do so, brothers and sisters. My grandma texted me a great quote from Charles Spurgeon about the church yesterday. Spurgeon said, a church that does not exist to reclaim heathenism, to fight evil, to destroy error, to put down falsehood, a church that does not exist to take the side of the poor, to denounce injustice, and to hold up righteousness is a church that has no right to be. May we be a church and a people who bring folks to Christ, who take the side of the poor and the oppressed, who are loud in our denunciation of injustice and anything that tends toward oppression, who are beacons of repentance and righteousness. Why? Because Spurgeon says so? No, because the written word commands us to be so, and the enfleshed word by his spirit empowers us to do so. Let me say it one more time. Why? Why? Why are we to be that kind of church? Because Spurgeon said so? No, because the written word commands us to be so, and the enfleshed word by his spirit empowers us to be so. By the spirit, let us be joyful beacons of the word. Let us be conduits of the Lord's blessing. May we wield the word not as a sword to wound, but as a scalpel to heal. May may we wield the word not as a club to bludgeon, but as a salve to soothe. May we wield the word not as a chain to oppression, but as a key to liberation. Because if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you do not know that freedom, this is your invitation. The Christ of the scriptures died to save you, to unite you to himself. Trust him. Yes, you're a wreck. Yes, your sin is impossible to fight on your own. Yes, you've tried over and over again and failed. Thankfully, your salvation does not depend on your performance. And in the face of a loving Savior, your corruption is not enough to keep him from you. Yes, sin escalates quickly, but grace abounds all the more. Throw yourselves at the feet of the, of the throne, dear brother. Throw yourself at the feet of the throne, dear sister. We'll be here to pray with you. Pray with me.